Good afternoon. My name is Matt Clark. I'm visit, uh, assistant professor of practice in the art and art history department at the University of Texas in Arlington. I want to welcome you all today to our first virtual visiting artist talk. Um, under these unusual circumstances, we hope that we can still deliver to all those who watch and listen the same interesting, inspiring, and culturally rich dialogue as we have in the past. Uh, without collaboration, this wouldn't be possible, and I want to thank a few people before we get started. Firstly, Chang Hee Chun and his math film productions and his student crew. I want to thank uh, uh, from the bottom of my heart for making this all possible, because they're doing all the behind the scenes work right now that really makes this a lot better than I could have done. I also want to thank our chair of our department, August Davis, as well as the members of the Visiting Artists Committee for all their hard work and due diligence to make this happen. I'm beyond delighted to welcome today alum, artist, creator, innovator, Francisco Moreno. Francisco was born in Mexico City in 1986 and immigrated to Arlington, Texas in 1992. In 2006, he attended the Conceptual Design Summer Program at the Tecnológico de Monterrey at the Queretaro campus in Mexico. Moreno returned to Arlington to complete his BFA at UTA in 2010. He received the Ideas and Art Charitable Foundation Scholarship while here. In 2012, he graduated from the Rhode Island, Island School of Design, where he received the Arch and Ann Giles Kimbrell Award. That was for In 2014, he received an award from the DMA in order to complete his WCD project. In 2016, he received an artist microgrant from the Nasher Sculptural Center that aided in the production of the chapel. Francisco divides his time between Dallas, Texas and Mexico City. Welcome, Francisco. Welcome, happy to be here. How are you today? Doing really good. Francisco and I had the opportunity to uh, have a little chat inside the chapel about two weeks ago at the DMA. It, it was great just to be in this three-dimensional uh, painting and to talk about it. We have a short video that we want you to all to watch. It will be followed by a continued conversation and finally a Q&A. So if you have any questions uh, during the talk, please just enter those in the chat to the right um, and we will cover as many as we can. I'll have Francisco give you a little background to the chapel and then we'll watch the video and, and get back to talking. So, um, yeah, if you don't know, the chapel is an all-encompassing painting structure. It's a project that I worked on from 2016 to 2018. Um, I was, I'm very grateful to be back at my uh, bachelor's alma mater, uh, and I'd like to say thank you because uh, I was given access to the sculpture uh, room in the summer of 2017 to build uh, the structure of the chapel. So. Um, the chapel is currently on view at the Dallas Museum of Art, uh, and yeah, look, looking forward to talking, talking about it. And it was a recent acquisition, so a great opportunity for a young artist like Francisco to really increase his visibility, and the DMA is a pretty great place to have. Check out happening. the video. It's so great to be here this morning with Francisco in his painting, inside his painting at the DMA and just a, a treat to be here and able to uh, talk with the artist and UTA alum about, about his piece, about the generation of it, the production of it uh, and so forth. And, and while we're in here, it's just an amazing place to be all encompassed in a painting and, and maybe we, we start with, with just talking about the chapel. Tell me about the chapel. So yeah, the chapel is an all-encompassing uh, painting structure inspired by a Spanish Romanesque uh, chapel I saw in Spain in 2016. I loved the experience and uh, when I saw it, in, um, I saw the original chapel in Spain, I knew I wanted to take this format and see how it would apply to, a contem to, to um, our kind of contemporary world. I had never experienced anything like that before, so I had my little, um, so I was at the Prado in Spain, I had my little pamphlet and had my pen and I measured the, the, the chapel, um, the hermitage of uh, La Veracruz de Madurero, 
I measured it with, uh, with my feet and wrote down the dimensions. Now, this, this had to be so encompassing, I couldn't imagine. Uh, how long did this take? So it was a, uh, since, the, since I had the idea, since I made the, the Google SketchUp mock-up in 2016, it, it was then a year of me getting my ducks in a row to figure out how to make it, and then a year of painting. So two years, um, two years of me being in here laboring, and then, oh, sorry, one year of me being in here laboring with uh, a year before it of planning and figuring it out. I, I look around and I see so many art historical and contemporary references. Uh, let's jump into that and maybe tell me about some of the inspirations or references and, and maybe what you were thinking as you were creating this piece, as you were inside. As an artist, you, you're, you end up as a painter in my case. Uh, I am very influenced by visual culture uh, and part of visual culture is uh, painting history, right? So uh, having studied painting, you become really interested in the history of kind of um, that focus. So I loved looking back through time and seeing how painting has existed and, uh, and how it still seems somewhat relevant. And, and it became a really interesting experience to pull from so many different uh, uh, visual elements and see how they would exist together. I think what's really fascinating about being a painter today is that uh, you can get on the internet and I mean even like Google Arts and Culture a lot of museums put their collections online right so uh, you know back when uh, Velasquez was learning to paint in Spain he only really had the royal collection to look at now we can look at everything, right? So uh, how do we process all this information? I mean, it's kind of overwhelming, but it's also incredibly fascinating. We have such an amazing access to, to so much history nowadays in our phones. That was definitely inspirational to, to, to how, what I wanted to explore in the chapel. And you see, obviously, I think things from um, The Last Judgment in there, is that that? And some Aztec or Mayan figurines. Is that, um, do you, are you thinking about your Latino heritage at any point when you're painting some of these things? And, and how, how much does that come into your work or how conscious of you? You know, I think what's fascinating is that, you know, I, I was born in Mexico, grew up here, would often go back. So w something that I really want to communicate in the work is this, th this kind of sense of being uh, transnational or uh, or aware that it's not just one culture centric I think when I grew, I grew up I kind of came of age here in, in DFW so I remember feeling like um, like a true culture I, I don't know how other another way to explain it but uh, I th there's so many different elements and all these elements kind of are a culmination of, of, of a culture or a heritage and I feel like it has to have everything for me for it to feel authentic and for it to feel pure because it, my experience is that of everything from like Mesoamerican to Eurocentric to, to European inspiration. Now take me back to when you were creating this and, and how much obviously you had to do a lot of planning but maybe I wanted to start in, in that with, with the imagery and, and how you maybe curated it down to this what the thought processes were as you were painting it, you know? I fell in love with the space in Spain and I wanted to build the structure and paint inside of it. So it was pretty much a three-dimensional canvas, right? I didn't really know what was gonna go inside and that was a purposeful um, decision because I, I had done a, a, a large project uh, in 2015 called the WCD project which was kind of a reimagination of Washington crossing the Delaware. And I, I, I mocked that project up in Photoshop. And I pretty much just executed that project. And, and at, at that point, I felt almost like a machine because I just projected the image and I painted. So when I started working on this project, I really wanted it to develop naturally and organically. I, I wanted to respond to the images as they were coming about, which made it a little bit more difficult because you don't really have um, a strict plan to work off of, but it became, it felt more pure because, you know, you'd paint an image and then, you know, you experience something 
that day and you'd come back the next day and you'd think, oh, I was going to put this thing here, but no, actually I'm going to do this, uh, I'm going to, uh, this other element seems more um, true to, to, to how I feel, you know? I mean, it's, so I guess the intention, the intention was like, I know what I want to do, but I still had a, a, a amount of space for improvisation, which is, and for intuition to come into play, because it's a balance of both. Right. I see a lot of like repeated patterns and, and marks, and I know in the documentary that you produced about the making of this, uh, you had a reference to Alabrijas. Yes. And I got really interested in Alabrijas when I went to Oaxaca for my first time and, and met uh, the Angeles, and was just blown away by the intricate details and uh, symbols and patterns that go into that now you were inspired or that kind of drove you to make some of these things maybe talk about that a bit yeah so um for those of you that don't know alabrijas are like kind of these like um little wooden sculptures made by artists in mexico i think they started early 1900s and there are these this i forget the i think it's maybe I, i'm not going to say the name because i'm going to get it wrong but this guy had this vision of this mysterious monster and he's like woke up and carved it and um and then he painted it, and then is it, and then he just like with these very with his very tiny brush painted these intricate patterns, and I think what I loved about it was the idea, the notion of the artist working on on these objects, and like it, it was a way for me to uh, really appreciate kind of the production of painting. Like when we'd go to Mexico, you would see you see these artists making these these alebrijes, and I think it's such a beautiful thing. And I was like, how do you communicate that, like in a way that's not that? that that's a, kind of like my own interpretation of it. And w what I wanted you to come in when you walked into this space, I was in love with the idea that you could kind of look at the painting and then you could see like these little brush marks. So like even, everything we see behind us was uh, the final layer was painted with a tiny, you know, zero round brush. So, I mean, for all of you visiting, I recommend you, you come in and look it up, look at it closely because it wasn't something that was um, painted quickly or gesturally. It was something that was very kind of time consuming and a labor of love. Now, when you finally finished that last brush mark, was it a, a, a feeling of satisfaction? What was the feeling that you had when you completed something of this scale? Yeah, it felt pretty good. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it felt good. You know, I think, um, I mean, th this project was a leap of faith. And I mean, there were times when I was working on it where I questioned my sanity, like, why am I doing this? Um, uh, I, I guess I'm very fortunate that I had a lot of great support throughout the way. Um, met a lot of great people and that's something really fascinating about these projects is that they, they end up being so big that you really can't do everything yourself you do have to reach out to, to people to help you i mean i had uh, really great friends who are architects david dross and lance rainey that kind of helped me figure out um, some structural components um, they introduced me to a lighting designer jill Clores, who is an amazing person and helped me figure out the best way to light this piece I worked with a, a craftsman, uh, Seth Lorenz, who helped me. Uh, I could not build the, this beautiful arrow slit window. I designed it, but I couldn't build it. So you begin to really outsource um, certain parts and, uh, and, and when you're working on something this large. You know, I'm thinking about the fresco that you must have seen in the Prado. And we typically see these frescoes richly painted. And we're looking at yours, and there's a little bit of color, but it's mostly black, white, and gray. When I, when I was working, like, I, I knew I wanted there to be a color component to the, the way that you experienced the work. But I also knew that figuring out the color, because color is a very complicated thing, um, to figure out the color would have been just, I don't think I could have done it in the time that I had. So my strategy was to lay a foundation of color. So the first layer is, um, it was all like the first layer of the chapel was almost this huge abstract painting. So if you look behind a lot of this imagery, you see these fields of color, which I would then like kind of clear coat and then paint on top of. And I think something that the, color, that the lights do that we haven't really talked about 
um, these lights are really beautiful LEDs. Um, they pull kind of the color from the back and bring it forward. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that, that was a very like, uh, you know, like I think when you when I was working on this project, it's like, okay, what are my parameters? These are my parameters. This is what I'm, this is what I'm going to work with. Right. You know. And I think that that's what this this does. That's different than the, your standard painting on a wall. That it is really immersive when you come in here and are just kind of hit with all of this um, imagery from ancient art to to the present day. And it's really just amazing because I think about well, how do you make painting three dimensional? How do you take it out into space, and I think you've really done this in a way that I wouldn't have considered looking back to art history and being moved by that particular experience. I can't help, you know, I'm positioned here to see this middle finger with the bald eagle perched on top. So the, the middle finger was something, of the, one of the first things I painted in the chapel, and it was one of the first things because I feel like it freed me up to paint whatever. I wanted something that I've struggled with is kind of like, oh, and, and a lot of artists, friends as well, like you feel like you're holding back, like, oh, like people aren't gonna like this or gallery's not gonna like this or like curators aren't gonna like this or my friends aren't gonna like this. And then I didn't wanna have that weight with the chapel. And you know, a chapel is the religious structure. Um, so by painting that middle finger, that was like one of the first things I painted that middle finger and um, and I wanted it to have that honesty and that sincerity and, and, the, and the humor. Like, I, I, like there's a monster truck flying through the air. Like, I, like the, the humor is also a very huge component to, to like this project, right? I guess lastly, what I'm interested, you know, what's next for you? What's the, what's the next big project? Because you seem to move from one to the next and I have to think that you've got something moving around that headspace. Right now, I'm making tiny paintings. That's what's keeping me interesting. And that's what's keeping me interested. Um, but for the future, I would like to build another chapel. So um, that's all I'll say about that. It'll be, a little bit, it'll be a little bit bigger than this one. Well, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. We can't wait to see it, so we'll have to stay tuned. Excellent. <laughs> all right. That was a lot of fun. That was a good time in there, huh? Yeah, you guys did a wonderful job with the video. Well, so. It was my first time seeing it too, and it was a, a delight to see, and, and what a great job you guys did. Thank you again, Mav Films. Thank you. I want to like reverse now and go back to your younger years, and, and maybe start with your childhood. What was your childhood like? Were you exposed to art at an early age? So, uh, yeah, my, my mom paints. And she taught me a lot of kind of like the intro, um, you know, the, the basics uh, to painting, which I'm very grateful. And my mom's, my, my dad's mother, my grandmother is also a painter. So uh, I'm fortunate that my family was supportive when I told them I wanted to uh, pursue this as a career. Because I know a lot of kids' parents don't think that that's a, a smart path to go down. Yes. They still believe in the myth of the starving artist, what I, which I've debunked to them. But it's still there and still a pretty scary leap. But you kind of started your, your, your education a little differently. You went to this program in Mexico and then you came to UTA. Maybe t take us through those, those periods of time and what you went through and you know, maybe how you pivoted from choosing one area and moving to the next. Right, so I started out in architecture at uh, UT, at uh, Texas Tech University. I did that for a year. Then I did a um, summer workshop in uh, Querétaro, industrial design workshop. So I, I've gone from like, it's funny, I started out with architecture, then industrial design. I tried to go into uh, graphic design, but ended up taking a painting class uh, with Marilyn Jolly and fell in love with painting. So I decided to stick with it. Shift again. Yeah. So, what, what were some of the first paintings you were making here at UTA? So, uh, man, like just trying to make some but like Dolly knockoffs, you know, mm -hmm. I mean. He, Who wasn't inspired by Dolly when we were young and you were no. slowly getting this um, 
Rolodex of artists that were your heroes. Yeah. So Dolly <laughs> was one of the early guys. Who else? Because I, you know, I had him, of course. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, Dolly, one of them. Also looking at uh, the, the the Mexican muralist Diego Rivera, Siqueiros, Orozco. I've, I think I've always had a soft spot in my heart for them. Sure. So I tried. I mean, I, it's funny because I think I was just copying a lot of the work. I didn't really understand. I I didn't understand. I don't know if I understand understood it conceptually, but I visually was very compelled by the work. So. Um, for me, I think a lot of painting and, and making is a way for me to learn. Like I, I think I learn through making and uh, it, it's a way to enter a subject and to kind of discover so many elements about it, right? So um, in, in like sp specifically Diego Rivera, like, you know, looking, copying some of his work and making my own variations of it um, I think you could pull the things that maybe were unique to yourself and, and, and use those to move forward. Mm -hmm. And maybe those muralists were some kind of subconscious inspiration to, to tackle these larger projects because you seem to tackle these really sizable projects. Absolutely. So I don't know if it's possible to uh, load up one of the first images from the slide uh, presentation. There's, yeah, I think um, that they're doing that. I did a, a project here, which I got the Ideas and Art Award called um, Diversity, in which I took photos of um, all, a diverse group of students mm -hmm. at UTA, and I made portraits of them. Each was three by four feet, and I bolted them together and made this huge installation painting. So I think it was my first installation painting, and I installed it here in this gallery, Gallery West. Okay. And I think that's when I learned that you can bolt paintings together to make a structure, which is something that I then carried on throughout my career, resulting with the chapel project. Right. So that was your really first project, although you probably didn't consider it one. Absolutely. Yeah, it was definitely the first. It, it, you know, yeah, yeah, I think so. You're, you're a painter. Right. And all of these other choices, especially with technology being so big and, and entering the art world, you know, I think about um, Team Lab doing all the cool stuff with technology and the Laffer Elias and why paint today? You know, it's funny because in high school I, I actually learned how to paint on Photoshop with a tablet before I, before I ever picked up real paints. Like Hockney. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think what's really interesting about painting is the physicality of it. I mean, you can see an image on your phone, but it's still different than seeing an image in person. And I, one, of my, all, one of my big loves of, in life is going to art museums and seeing art, you know? I think I, I love it. I do it everywhere I can if there's a museum. In the city that I'm visiting, I have to go see it. And, and I think you, there's a, those are things that you just can't create. You can't create that experience in, in any other way than to paint it and to stand like even with the murals that inspired the chapel somebody stood in front of that space and painted on those walls and you feel this very human connection to this art so I think that's why I continue to paint today. That's great. You started off in a different you know field and then moved to 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 painting were there any people that you, your, your heroes back then that you looked up to? I know you said Dolly and the Mexican muralist, but certainly there were, there were more people that were filtering through your um, consciousness and somehow um, being influenced by them in a certain way. You know, I've got my you know, 10 or so artists that I certainly was um, influenced by. Do you have some more that oh, man. maybe the students listening could, could <laughs> discover some new artists? Right, right. I have binders, binders of binders full of artists that I, that I love. Um, I think one of my major ones that I looked at in undergrad was um, Josh Smith, mm -hmm. who I think he, he shows, uh, he showed with Larry Gaga's team, now he shows with David Zwerner, and um, he's, a mo like, uh, he's a modernist, and I think the way that he thought about painting was very free and open, and I, I, st I, I still think he, he thinks that way about his painting, and that took a lot of weight off of the pressure of painting. Mm -hmm. um, I still love, I, I know I, I already mentioned the Mexican muralists. I, I'm a big fan of Velazquez and 
Goya, a lot of the Spaniards. Especially if you spend some time in the Prado. Right, absolutely. It's a rich museum. Some of the best Peter Paul Rubens I've ever seen are in that museum. They're fantastic, yeah. <laughs> so you start on this trajectory. You're making these big projects at UTA. You've decided that you want to be an artist and this is going to be your profession. You found your calling. What was the first big break? You know, you get out of undergrad, you went right to RISD. Right. What was that first big breakthrough? Was it getting into RISD or? I think getting That's into, awesome. yeah, the Rhode, the Rhode Island School of Design was a great experience, met a lot of great artists, I uh, met Josh Smith, like he was one of the first visiting artists, which was amazing, like to meet one of your heroes. Our next visiting artist is the RISD alum too. Michelle Rawlings, right, I was at school with her. Um, yeah, so RISD was a huge break, uh, and after graduating, I got to work with uh, Thomas Fulmer in education at the Wachowski Collection. Mm -hmm. So that was an amazing experience as well because I got I was exposed to so much uh, cutting edge contemporary art, right? So I got to work uh, with uh, with Thomas Fulmer and and really de developing and researching um, the contemporary collection there. So and and use and then educating the visitors about it. So it was kind of like a third, you know, school. Right. And I think that really opened up a lot of doors in my mind as and well. And I think you mentioned a good thing. I always believed when I was you know, your age and coming up as an artist that you needed to have um, employment somewhere in the creative arena in order to stay inspired. And I think that really helped. I, I worked at the Getty for five years when I was just out of grad school. And, and that provided a, a great experience because you're still learning. Absolutely. I think you have to be sponges as, as an artist. I'm still thinking about undergrad and all these students watching today. And what was your mindset as an, as an undergrad art major? Were you fully committed? What was your feeling then? Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I, I, I was really excited because I was all, I think I was always an artistically driven person uh, in high school I you know they I, I took like orchestra and you took all these other electives that the kind of like the, the the curriculum kind of imposes on you so what was great about college for me was that I could finally just take all the art classes that I've always really been passionate about I'm, I'm a creative person so I was just so enthusiastic to be taking whatever class possible and learning as much as possible and looking for whatever opportunity I could to ex share my work you know mm -hmm. like I mean this gallery uh, is a it's kind of really awesome to be in here again because I had a couple shows in here have you been back into this gallery since you graduated I mean I, I did what some visit yeah I, vis I was here building right. the, the chapel like two years ago or I guess three years ago so it's it's just cool you know I mean I I guess if there's anything I could say to students in school right now is just to take any opportunity you can to, to share your work with, with anybody and talk about it. No matter what it is, right? Absolutely. No matter if you think it's bad or the best thing ever. Absolutely. Ten years ago, it's about ten years ago that you graduated, what would you tell your younger self now that you've experienced a lot, that you have a little bit more understanding of your work and the world at large? Yeah, you know, I think uh, I can be a little hard on myself, and I talk to, have a lot of conversations with artist friends that also are hard on themselves. I mean, it is a, a hard career, um, but, you know, there's downs, but there's also ups, so you just kind of have to, you know, keep on moving when you feel, when things aren't going the best that they can, but you, you take, you make the best of the situation always, and you keep moving forward, and, and you know, things will be better, you know? Right. What, um, we talked about this briefly at the chapel. Are you a guy that will go back and into a work and rework and rework and rework? Or do you sit down and, you know, I know you do daily drawings, but for a painting, for example, how much will you go back in? Are you like a serial revisionist? I, I mean, when something is done, it's done. Like, how do you know when it's done? You know, I think it's like if you're trying, if you're conversing with somebody and you have a statement you want to make, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what is that statement that you're trying to make with 
the painting at hand or the project at hand and does it communicate that yes all right because you could then try to say okay i made my point with this work of art but let's let's now let's make this let's just add on to this part of the maybe the aesthetics component but like you already got the message across so I try not to linger too much on a project, like if it's a smaller work, like if it's done and it communicates what it needs to communicate, you know, put it aside, maybe make another one. If there's things that you wanted to fix on this one, maybe you fix on the next one, you know, but I think it's important to keep moving forward. I always find it really difficult to tell people when you know it's finished because it's so hard to put in words what that finality is because all of these variables have to align themselves, all the stars have to align and it's really hard to describe in words. Absolutely. <laughs> where, what do you find, where do you find your inspiration? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, that, I think that, that's a difficult question to answer because I feel like inspiration accumulates and it, it comes from multiple sources. And, uh, you know, especially right now as I'm working on, on the new works, I realize that I'm filtering so much information that I've looked at, whether it's art historical or po or from popular culture or personal. Uh, as I'm working something, I'll be like, oh, like, like, it comes intuitively, but then you think, oh, like, this, it's funny how this, the, like, Rubens is coming up, and now Raphael, and, and now, like, uh, Carrie James Marshall, and, and uh, so it's like all these things are coming together. To, oh, and then, and then, like, my parents' backyard, you know, all these things come together into this painting, you know, so, um, I think inspiration is, I guess to answer your question, inspiration's always coming in. It's just processed when I'm working. Am I always inspired to go in the studio and work? No, but it's important to get in there because you know, you'll, you'll realize that sometimes if you've just spent 15 minutes working on something, mm -hmm. all these things that you've thought about creatively will kind of seep in and, and, and show in the work. So. And I think you could really see that in the chapel. You know, you filter through so many images and it's, all across, like I mentioned, art historical references, but also about machinery and then contemporary culture. So I think you've done a great job of filtering all those things that you look at and modes of inspiration. And you know, something I'd like to say is, you know, there's times when, when, I, when I get in the studio and I don't know what to do. And, and this happened with the chapel as well. Like I, you hit like a roadblock and sometimes you just have to go get inspired. Like right. you, you, inspiration doesn't always come to you. Like you have to go read a book that you think might add to your art. Go look at a, a, um, a, a book of an artist that you really like. Find a web page, go like down a rabbit hole of something that you think is super fascinating to you the answers might be, the answers are in your curiosity. You know, like the curiosity that you have as an individual, as a creative, um, you have to take that curiosity and delve deep and, and find, sometimes you have to find inspiration through your curiosity. I think bringing up curiosity is great because that's something I always encourage my students to, to have. Because you need to be curious, I think, to really um, be a creative today and respond to all of the things that are going on in our work. You mentioned early the challenges that artists face. Right. It's hard to be an artist today. It's always been hard to be an artist. What are some of the challenges that you faced in pursuing a career in the arts? Right. I mean, I think as an artist, you, you perhaps maybe I, myself as an artist, I was always an idealist. I think that's why you choose to study and like in, in the arts and um, I think it's compromise <laughs> it's like okay I have this really awesome idea I want to do it how do I do it okay I need you know hundred thousand dollars okay I don't have a hundred thousand dollars how do I <laughs> do this other thing okay like okay let's have two hundred dollars how do I make this thing work you know like you find I think you, you, you have to find that compromise to make the thing you want well I think what's really fascinating for me now is that I really enjoy working small. Mm -hmm. I think I used to, I've made so many large projects in the past that I've found kind of consolation in working small. So it's, I don't know if that's answering your question, but. It still touches on interesting yeah. topics. What's the <laughs> hardest thing that you've faced being an artist? Yeah, so technically I think in 2015 when we did the WCD, WCD project, the Washington Crossing in Delaware, which is this, I don't know if they can pull it up. It's, um, it up. it's uh, 
a life-size reimagination of Washington crossing the Delaware and painted it. I painted it. Um, then I repainted Then I got this car and I painted the car as well. My brothers and I kind of souped up the car. We hot rodded this car. And uh, we, we were going to do a performance uh, put together by the Dallas Symphony Orchestra in which the car was to do donuts in front of the painting. And um, it was all done on a budget, very, like, and a very tight budget. So like the night before the performance, we were still trying to get the engine to work. Like, um, so the fact that... If the engine didn't work, the piece wouldn't be pulled off. Yeah, and um, so we... I remember just like my brother had to, he worked till like 12 o'clock that night. I, I was, I, was, I just went to sleep and I just said, well, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. But I mean, that was probably one of the most stressful situations. Some of that's out of your control unless you're a great mechanic. I know your brothers are, but. Yeah, but you know, like it, 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 the, car, the car was built on a very small budget. So it's like, there's only, I mean, there's only so, like, only so much a great mechanic can do with a tight budget. So I know he did, he pulled it together. The performance went down smoothly. It's on my website if you go to. FranciscoMoreno.net under projects. You can see, you can click on WCD project and watch the video of the car doing the donuts. But that was one of the most stressful art experiences of my life. So um, when I made the chapel, I was like, I don't want any moving parts. Right. Like <laughs> it's built and you can walk in it. The only moving part is the viewer. They can walk around, move around, and exit, but no mechanical components. Right. We always talk about the the difficulties and the challenges that artists face. What's the, there's a great thing about being an artist. There's beauty in that and it's, there's a lot of freedom. What's, what's the best thing for you for being an artist? The best thing for me is that I get to take my interests and delve deeply into them, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's funny because when I, when I meet artists that I really love, they're just, I think they're like, I want to go back to that word curious. They're incredibly curious about their interests and then they become intoxicating in how curious they are. You know, it's like, oh, like they're passionate about, um, like in my case, I'm, I like painting history. Like I love talking about painting history or, um, you know, if you're interested in like abstraction or even like culture, like uh, you, you like the Alebrijes, I think that's something really fascinating. Like if right. someone's talking to you and you're like, oh yeah, I'm like, I, went to, I go to, down to Mexico to Oaxaca and I, I visit these artists and these artists that make these beautiful, mysterious sculptures. Like all of a sudden, like you're, you're enriched by your interests, and I think that part of yourself becomes intoxicating. And, and I think for me, like that's kind of like the best part about being an artist, like really diving deep into the things that make you aware of the world that we live in. And there's a lot of joy in that, at least for me. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, not always joyful. There's plenty of times you're in the studio where you want to throw the paint on the wall and exit. There's that as well. You're talking about these projects, and we, we touched on that in the chapel, but you're always undertaking these rather large projects, the WC, um, the chapel, the slate paintings. Maybe right. let's go into that a little bit and, and why it's for you projects instead of series, because for me, and I know a lot of painters, they work in series. You, right. on the other hand, work in projects. Right. Um, you know, I think, I think, um, gosh, how do I answer that question? Uh, let me think about it for a second. I, maybe it's almost like, you know, maybe the topics that I was trying to wrangle at the time, like they had to be expressed in an installation or a project. Like I, I've tried, I think I've always tried to make like a serial series of paintings and I'd always end up venturing in different directions. So I think at the end of the day, it became a f matter of format mm -hmm. that would best communicate my ideas. Like Slates was kind of like this project that tried to break down all the art that I saw when I worked at, the, all the art that I saw in school and in like UTA at RISD and then also when I worked in education at the Rachowski Collection, like how do you process style production. Um, that, and then the car project that was dealing with uh, kind of the transnational immigrant story like how and I guess these formats just made more sense for what I wanted to express like I think the chapel there's no other way to communicate that idea right you know than to like create the structure that I experienced right 
So, but now it's funny because I'm like really into like early Renaissance paintings. Like uh, you Rafferty. can tell by all the new paintings that you're doing, which we'll hopefully show the audience in a few minutes here. So, uh, but now it's funny because now I'm, I think I'm finally able to make smaller works and think in series, you know. But I think at the end of the day, it comes down to like, what is your vision? What is your idea? How do you best communicate it? And sometimes working serially uh, in a modernist manner doesn't, you know, but it could if that's kind of like your intention, which I guess it hasn't been for me if, in the past, but might, might be in the future, yeah. And for those who, uh, hopefully you've seen the slate paintings, there's an installation um, on there. Maybe talk about the slate because it was this another hugely ambitious project. I don't know if you had a hundred or two hundred four foot uh, curved panels. It was seven, so it was seventy. Seventy. Seventy, uh, and they kind of all hung all over the the gallery, um, like salon style. Salon style, and I think for me, I've always been, I, I guess, like a chameleon. Like I feel like I can. I think makes sense looking at that body because there's, you know, you have the unicorn, abstract process paintings, right? So everything in between. Yeah, and you know the thing, and that's where my, my curiosity is like, okay, I like all these things. How do I set up the parameters for me to explore all these ideas of painting? So like, okay, I'll make one one format, a canvas or a panel that's four feet by three feet with like a half inch curved corner. Mm -hmm. Um, and then like I can then okay I want to do a, a series of unicorn paintings I want to do a series of uh, process based paintings I want to do a ready made painting of a mirror you right. know mm -hmm. so it, the format made sense and I think what was really great about it is that I was able to work through ideas mm -hmm. you know in in a, in a format that allowed me to really foc end up focusing on the things that maybe are more important at the end. In these projects, you mentioned getting help from your brothers and at the chapel collaborating with uh, a lot of different kinds of people. Could you touch on that and the importance of collaboration or even asking for help? Because we know we can't do everything and we're not experts at everything. For right. example, lighting. You found a lighting designer that did a, a great job of lighting that probably difficult to right. light chapel. Right. Um, you, 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 you collaborated with architects to get the, the structure right. Yeah, and you know, I think, I think what's really, I mean, it's funny because my brother, he's an engineer, and, he, and he, when, he, he, when he was at work, he was like, oh yeah, people would tell me to do things I didn't know how to do. Like, okay, go do this, okay. I was like, okay, well, he just reaches out to somebody that knows how to do it, and then they'd help him, you know? And I was like, well, that makes sense with art. Like, okay, I want to do this car chapel even the slates you know mm -hmm. you, you know you just I mean it's, you just reach out to people and know how to do it and, and it's it's usually kind of a fun thing because these are atypical projects for them so you're like oh, I'm doing this like I'm gonna make a car that does donuts in front of a painting okay like I remember calling the talking to the people that helped us prepare the engine bore the mm -hmm. engine they were like, oh, this is cool, and they gave us like a really, like a better camshaft for the engine. You know, it's like, I mean, I guess to bring it back in, to reel it back in, if you have something you want to do and you don't know how to do it, don't stop and not do it. Like, find somebody that knows how to do it, talk to them, and they, they'll give you advice. You know, if, at, you know, they'll maybe direct you in the way that you need to go to realize this thing. I think artists are the best problem solvers because we're either doing that visually or figuring something out that's beyond your, your, your know-how. I want to shift now to something that I think was really interesting in a kind of an entrepreneurial approach with your debt paintings. Mm -hmm. I was really interested in, in the idea behind it because it was, maybe you should tell the audience what the debt paintings were and why you did it. And, what it helped you do. Right, so um, graduating from RISD, moving to DFW, I mean, I didn't have a gallery, but I did have debt from school, and I figured, like, okay, like, what happens if I break, it was around $42,000 in debt, and I was like, okay, like, what if I break down the, it to, like, 500 paintings, each painting's, like, you know, three by five inches, and I sell them for $100, and I try to make 10, 10 of month you know i try to sell them and you know people were buying them and i paid off i think like 
so far I paid off twenty five thousand dollars of debt just just by that alone. Yeah, just I that's mean that's pretty amazing. Think one hundred dollars per painting. How many paintings did you have to sell? So I've so, I'm still working on it. I've imagine. sold like two hundred and fifty. So that's impressive. Yeah. You also have collaborated with different kinds of creatives, which I think is interesting too. So you worked with, was it the ballet? You worked with the symphony for the Saluna thing, right. with the WC project. And then for the parade costumes, you worked with the ballet? Yeah, so it was Dallas Neoclassical Ballet. I don't think they're, I think they moved to Houston, they've changed the name. But um, they were here uh, in 2017, I guess in 2016, they reached out to me. They wanted to do this like 100 year anniversary performance of Parade, which was Put, uh, which is a mural by, um, but that, uh, not mural, a uh, performance. I forget, the, but I think the co ballet company is Ballet Rousseau, mm -hmm. uh, which they, which like the music but was by Satie. It was supposed to be very avant-garde, very cutting edge. Picasso did the costumes for it and they wanted to recreate it um, in 2017. So they invited me to make the costumes. And um, I actually, that one was a huge collaboration with my mom. She did a lot of the sewing for those costumes because I, <laughs> I don't know how to sew, but again, reached out to somebody that knew how to, to do right. something. Another instance of collaboration. Right. What, what, what advice would you have for an art student today? What would you say to them? Right. I mean, I think be incredibly curious and, and work through ideas. I, I, uh, what's his name from... Um, this American Life, I forget the host, uh, but he says that like, your taste is really good, but like, what you can produce might not be at the level of your taste. So you'll make something and it's like you get really sad because it's not what you had in mind. Because right. your taste is up here, but like, what you're able to um, produce is down here. So I think, you know, don't get discouraged. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Ira Glass. Uh, I was going to yeah. say Ira. Yeah, yeah, Ira Glass. So, um, and I, I still don't think I'm there. I will still make, there's a lot of things I make in the studio that I like still down here. When you make an unsatisfactory painting in your mind, what happens to it? You cut it up and throw it away. So no one else sees it but you. Absolutely. So there's this importance of curating your work to who sees it, right? Absolutely, yeah. That, that some students might not think about. Yeah, and you know, I think like, it's like grading your own work. Like, okay, if, if my paintings get to like a, a low B, B a C. yeah, low B, and maybe a C, Not I don't door. really release, yeah, but like, but if it's a B for my level, then I keep, I keep it moving forward, yeah. Something that's come up with me a lot in my creative career, and I know comes up with a lot of younger artists, is the idea of this artist doubt. You know, that little monkey on our back that might tell us when we're struggling with a painting, that you're no good or whatever. How do you deal with some of that artist doubt that I know runs through probably every artist there is? Oh, you just, when you're working on something, it's the most important thing in the world for you. Right. So when it's not going well, you get really sad. So there, I mean, there's times when I'll be working on a painting, I'm like, this painting's horrible, I'm done, I, I have a horrible painting, I go to sleep, I wake up, and I go in the studio, I'm like, this painting's actually pretty good. <laughs> you know, I think sometimes you just. Perspective. Yeah, you just, you have to kind of put, set yourself aside, set the emotions to the side. You know, and I think the cool thing, the, one of the benefits about doing this more is that you learn to deal with the doubt. You learn to think like, okay, I'm doubtful this is going to work out, but I feel like it's going the right direction. And usually it always does. Right. You know, I think it's, you have to fight that. You just have to fight through it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and trust yourself and... It seems as you get older, and, and, or for me at least, that that artist's doubt seems to not be as loud as I get older and, and have more experience with what I do and how I do it. Absolutely. Um, so you did this big project. You finished it in 2018, got acquired by the DMA. What's, what's next for Francisco Moreno? So uh, I am I get painting a lot, I still paint every day, um, and maybe working you guys through can run through those, because the I think there's recent, some great images in there, more especially the, that you were talking about, influence from the Renaissance. Absolutely, so I do that, and then uh, I, I am, I would like to make another chapel, um, 
but this one this one's a little bit more ambitious so I'm actually working right now I'm just doing a lot of research um, and I know see. you're moving to Mexico was kind of or at least coming back and forth has kind of been put on hold with the whole corona so that kind of made you have to pivot and change a little bit too because you were expecting to go to Mexico City in March correct mm -hmm, right so yeah I just postponed a little bit I mean I'm still I'll still be the plan is to travel back and forth mm -hmm. between Dallas Fort Worth and Mexico City so uh, that'll still happen just gonna wait till conditions are more safe you know I mean the good thing is that I just need like a a little table some brushes some paints right. and I can I make found that you can work anywhere if you're uh, adaptable enough absolutely I think that's important I always like to bring wherever I travel to my watercolors and my little ball skin just to just to get ideas down you know right I think that's very important now I'm going to have some quick fire questions for you. All right. All right. Are you ready for them? Bring it on. I hope that we can ask all of the future visiting artists in this um, platform. Three characteristics you think are most important for artists. Characteristics. Uh, uh, curiosity. Yeah. Uh, do the work. Make the work. And um, man, talk to friends. Talk to artist friends. friends yeah. Speaking of that, what about how important has networking been and finding people that um, believe in you and support your work? Absolutely. You know, networking is such a, I don't know, that word seems really like corporate. Right. You know, um, I mean, I feel like just go make friends with a lot of people. Find your people. Like, that's, at the end of the day, you find your people. You go to an art event or whatever and you really like something and you end up talking about. Not, you know, like um, this artist that you both really like. And, that, and then you, that opens up a window and then. To, I guess, to also share your ideas always. Like, always be talking about your ideas, right. you know? I think, you, you know, that's the most important is finding your tribe. Yeah. Because you need those people that you can lean on for support. Yeah, and don't think of it as like, oh, I'm going to go meet so-and-so that's going to make my career. No, like, that's not how it happens. You go and you meet a lot of really fascinating people that are hopefully as enthusiastic about art as you and will maybe guide you in the right direction. Mm hmm I always tell my students that, hey, all the work takes place, at least the creative work in the studio, and a lot of artists tend to be a little introverted, so they don't want to get out of that studio. But the professional life and the professional side of it takes place all outside of that. So one, if they're introverted, needs to find a way to go and find that tribe and to interact with those people. Absolutely. Okay, here's the quick fire ones. What talent would you most likely like to have? Salsa dancing. Salsa dancing. That'd be cool. All right, that would be cool. What is your favorite journey? Journey. Um, man. I mean, just just uh, traveling throughout Europe. Okay. You know? What's your idea of perfect happiness? It's, I, I feel like I'm very fortunate because like, even though things could always be better, I mean, in the large scheme of things, I just want to be painting every day. And I get to do that right now. So and you're doing it. So you're, you're the happy. image of perfect happiness right here. If you could invite anybody to your dinner party, who would it be and why? I think I'd love, uh, you know, in researching, now that I'm researching this other chapel, I, diving deeper into the muralists. And I love um, Jose Clemente Orozco. So I think I would love to have a conversation with him. Yeah. Be a small dinner party? Yeah, small dinner party. Whom do you most admire? Oh, man. I'm just, I'm super grateful for my parents, you know? Yeah. Are they your they, heroes? Yeah, they, they let me. They were supportive at the beginning and very fortunate for that. Favorite brand? I, I'm anti capitalist. <laughs> okay, let's turn it over to the audience and we will start taking some questions for Francisco. I'm going to look on the chat line here and see what we have. We already, we already covered this one. How do you know when a painting is done? What, what are you currently reading? Ari wants to know what you, you're currently reading. Yeah, uh, trying, to get, uh, trying to get through Infinite Jest by um, David Foster Wallace. Ooh, that's a good one. How far are you? I have 100 pages left. That's good. I got through half. It's a great, it's a big commitment, but one of the best writers I've come across. 
painting faculty, Benjamin Terry asks, um, it seems like there's a desire to draw a connection between untrained and trained, high and low, craftsmen and artists, class classical sculptures versus monster trucks and middle fingers. And so, the, sorry, what's the, the... Maybe more of a statement. And then it goes on to the next one. Do you see the chapel as a conscious effort to speak about class and or equity, or it is a bright byproduct of your synthesizing your interests, day-to-day -day state of mind, et cetera? I think a synthesis in day to day. Okay. I was I, I forgot to ask you this question and someone is asking it. Cindy Thomas wants to know what type of paint and support did you use for the painting of the chapel on the inside? Right, so um, it's all it's pretty much they're all wooden panels that are gessoed and bolted together. Mm -hmm. So um, wooden panels, um, just plywood from those mm -hmm. um, and the paint was golden acrylics. Golden acrylics, your favorite brand? Yeah, uh, yeah. Do you I use any so. other brands? No, I'm mostly golden, yeah. Nova Color, no? I haven't tried it yet. You I should. should. All right. It's a little less expensive than golden out of LA. Okay. <laughs> NDXGO asks, do you consider most creatives to be insecure? I don't, I, you know, I don't know, I mean, I think there's a level of insecurity to exploring and creating work. Of course, there's always going to be doubt. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, I know that if you're creative and, and you are insecure about something, it's probably because you're learning. So um, perhaps we're all insecure a little bit, but it's like dealing, it's how do you deal with that insecurity? Do you let it paralyze you or do right. you work through it? So, and my my thoughts are, you, I tell my students this all the time. You have to believe in yourself first, and I think that's always where it comes from. Because as artists, if we don't believe in our own work that we put out into the world, how can we expect anybody else to believe in us? Absolutely. Are you a, a goal setter? You set goals. Absolutely. You write them down. Do you do them every year? How how, how do you how do you? Right. I mean, you know, you, you set, like, I mean, especially if you do, like, larger projects, you have to set goals because, they, I mean, you have to finish certain things by a certain time, you know? So, mm -hmm. like, like, with, with, with uh, like, the car, like, okay, I had to have the painting done so I could focus painting the car, and the car had to be done at this time so we could take it to the shop to finish working on it. So you have to set goals to finish stuff or you know even if you just have a show at a gallery like you have to be like okay like I want this is kind of like my idea how do I get it done you know and then I think what's really helped is setting micro goals so like okay like the large thing is the show that you're working toward right so okay you want to have let's say four paintings in your show okay like you, you know your work, you know how much each one's going to take, sit down, figure it out, and like try to work through it. And let's just say, base case scenario, you finish two of them, like that's fine, you know. But you like you have to have some sort of, it's a lot easier to get somewhere if you know where you're going. True. You know? Everybody needs a blueprint, right? The blueprint might change, you might pivot, but you need to know where you're going. Absolutely. In order, if you want to get there at least. Yes, okay, I have some more questions. Zach Kunsinu asked, how do you identify your artistic blocks and what do you do to get around them? And by the way, a lot of people are saying hi, Francisco. Oh, awesome. So you've got a lot of fans uh, watching today. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, artistic blocks. You know, it's funny because I think after I finished uh, Chapel, I, I painted, I drew every day, but I don't think I really finished any paintings in the past two years, I think, mm -hmm. um, which is fine. You know, you work through things. Um, but I think we talk a lot about getting in a studio and working, but working is also thinking and writing, you know? So I think just really sitting down and working through ideas mentally, journaling, mm -hmm. um, getting out of your normal uh, routine, you know? I think it's gonna be different for everybody depending on what you're making. So just kind of allowing yourself to see things from a different perspective really helps. and. Um, Usually sometimes the only thing you need is time. Like, I mean, sometimes you just like you're working on something and you know it's good, but you don't know how to 
how to do it. You just need some time to f figure out how to do it. So you set it aside and go into the next. Absolutely. I don't necessarily think I believe in blocks. You know, I, I always liken being an artist to an athlete. And you need to train yourself because being creative every day is necessary. So you, it's a muscle that you have to train. And if you don't do that frequently, in my mind, it doesn't come as easily. Right. So maybe when you were consumed with your chapel project, and then you had to pivot to start painting in, in a different way again, it might have been difficult, I don't know. Right. I mean, like at the end of the day, you have to work through it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think work and time, those two things are just important. And what did Agnes Martin say? Because she was always in search of perfection, but she always waited for inspiration to hit her in order to paint a painting. She said she would see those paintings and paint it, but she would just sit there until inspiration came. That's awesome. Yes Knight says, how do you receive the budget for your work? So, the, I mean, over like with the ideas and art, my first project here at UTA, I got, you know, it was $2,000 and um, that helped a lot. So I think what happens is you, begin to get more confident. Like with the car project, I, I got the grant from the DMA, but before that I kind of just realized that I had to start funding it myself. So I pay, put a lot of it on a credit card that I finally paid off like... Well, that's good. Like, yeah, like last year. So sometimes you just gotta put the money in yourself, you know, like maybe don't buy a new phone or new clothes and whatnot if your old phone still works, like maybe put that money aside. I've spent a lot of Pretty much a lot of my earnings go to my projects. And what's cool is that as you do these things, as you get better at them, you become more confident, you know, you're able to get funds from elsewhere, you know. But like institutions, like the DMA has a w artist grants, the Nasher has artist grants here at UTA. If you're a student, there's the ideas and art grants, so apply to these things. Yeah, I mean, all you students need to apply for any grant that you could get. You know, and or you know, scholarships. Absolutely. Or and, and sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and pay for things yourself. Last question here by Molly Fiden. Is there anyone you trust and always go to for feedback when you're in any stage of your painting? Yeah, you know, I, th I think I, I, have a really good I have really good friends, painting friends that I reach out to and I send out, like I, I talk to a lot and um, I trust their feedback and Usually send them a, uh, a text with an image like, oh man, is this salvageable? And they're like, yeah, <laughs> sounds good. That's great to have that feedback, that constant feedback. Well, I want to thank you, Francisco. This has been a lot of fun and a first of, of these many virtual programs. Um, you can check out more Francisco's work on his website, uh, franciscomoreno.net. Um, obviously, there's a lot of videos as well online that you can go see his work. Don't forget our next visiting, uh, virtual visiting artist is on the 14th of October. Same format, her name's Michelle Rawlings, uh, a local artist who went, was a fellow RISD student with Francisco. I hope you all can join us then. Thank you so much, thank you Francisco, and thanks to all of you guys who watched today. Thank you.